the first thing I want to do is we don't have any consent items. Um, does the committee approve the minutes? Yes. Councilmember Jarinski, Councilmember Zavonik. Okay, so if you get those over to me, I will sign them. If we could just move this agenda around so Judge Day can speak. I know he has a flight. Um, this is going to be regarding the cases of domestic violence in municipal court draft bill update. So would the committee be okay with me moving the agenda around? Yeah. Okay, Judge Day. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I appreciate you um, and your understanding. I, I'm at the airport, so if you start to hear... <laughs> People being called to their gate. Uh, I apologize in advance. Just want to give you a quick update on the domestic violence violence bill. It has not been introduced yet. The last um, that we have heard. <laughs> Brother. Yeah, they can have reading everyone for a Please do not. Sorry. Confirm passenger. All right, sorry, Rook. Uh, I feel like we can still hear you pretty clearly. Yeah, we can hear Judge Day. Just go ahead. We can go, we can adapt to the noise. Okay. We're sorry, um, <laughs> it has not been introduced. Um, there's been some proposed language as to amending the bill that would include the application of the victim's rights amendment in addition to the state uh, sentencing statute for all municipal courts that if they're going to do domestic violence cases, they have to follow the BRA, they have to follow uh, the state's sentencing statutes. So that's being considered, although um, we met with the House Minority Leader Lynch yesterday to provide him further information, and um, he's aware of, of this proposed bill as well. So I'll let you know as soon as I hear anything else. That's the update on the domestic violence bill. As you all know, there'll be a press conference on Monday regarding um, the CCJJ bill as it relates to motor vehicle theft and um, the removal of value within the state statutes in addition to the sentencing. Um, reform for that particular um, statute as well. We'll be voting on that here in about an hour um, for the CCJJ. Um, I believe that it will pass and that it will then be introduced first part of next week after the press conference. So that's my update. Happy to answer any questions if I can hear them and hopefully I'll... Judge Day, I do have to ask you something. So I was just sure. on the CML executive board. Actually, yep. I had to tap off because the meeting went longer and I had to do this one. But there was, I abstained from this vote because they said that it's basically the recommendation is support if amended. They said the league supports the authority of home rule municipalities to provide, regulate, conduct, and control municipal courts. So they basically said you were in those conversations. Yep. Um, with the other judges, so I abstained from this because I wanted to hear from you. So, are you in support of CML's position? If it's amended to the language that we proposed, which would be it would be a prohibition for municipal courts to, to prosecute domestic violence in their court unless they comply with the BRA and they also adopt the same sentencing structure as the state. So, if that language is adopted in added to the bill, then we would be in support of the bill. But if it's not, then we would still continue to strongly oppose um, the bill okay. as it's currently drafted. Again, the bill has not been introduced. And so I know okay. there's a lot of stakeholder meetings taking place on the bill. Um, okay. We don't know if it is going to be amended. We'll have to wait to see, but we did prop propose some language. And I think that's where CML, CML has been part of those conversations as well. That's where okay. they're coming from that if it is 
if the language that we propose is accepted and added to the bill, then we would be in support of the bill. Okay, so you do support this position at CML that they have right here. I abstain from this one because okay. I wanted to just have this have this discussion with you. So, okay, okay, thank you, Judge Day. Okay, thank you, thank you for your understanding. Judge Day goes. No. Okay. Thank All right. You. Thank you, Judge thank Day. You. Have safe Appreciate flight. it. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Thank you for members of the committee for adapting with the change with this uh, change in the agenda. Um, do we have Lori? To give us the uh, federal legislative update. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. How are y'all? We're doing well. Ready? Um, Congress is continuing to get organized. Um, I met with Congressman Crow's new legislative director last week. He's had some staff member and his excuse me staff member in his office. The staffer he had I've actually worked with before. Um, he's been on the Hill for fifteen years, so I think it'd be a great addition to the congressman. Um, I walked through the city's priorities. He's very much looking forward to meeting with you when y'all are in DC next month. Um, he said they do not have a timeline for earmarks, um, but he is very much um, very excited to work with the city of Aurora and the congressional district. Um, as you may have known, um, the city has had difficulty accessing its earmark money for safe outdoor space for all that the congressman had earmarked last year. However, um, John was able to put us in touch with HUD um, and Liz and your housing team and I met with the, how, how the HUD staffer that John put us in touch with and the contract for to get last year's earmark should be wrapped up very soon. So I thank the congressman staff profusely for that. Um, so sorry about that. Congress is still getting organized. House uh, Democrats and Republicans had their committee assignments. Um, Senators Bennett and Hickalupa will remain on their current committees. On the House side, um, the Democratic and Republican leadership have named some committees. Um, Crow's committee assignments have not been finalized yet. He does um, expect to remain on House Armed Services Committee. The State of the Union is going to be on February 7th. Uh, that is sort of the kickoff for Congress to begin the appropriations process, which I've, I've discussed earlier. Um, John said that was the same thing. So hopefully we'll get the appropriations earmarks request um, in forms early um, March. And the city, Liz and I are meeting um, as a group to discuss possible projects next week. Um, infrastructure grant funding. There was recently a new um, water smart program for system conservation. I shared with the World Water last week. Um, the raise grant for DOT is out as well. Um, protect this new grant program for extreme weather events, including um, tornadoes and snow, uh, should be out momentarily, as well as electric vehicle competitive grant programs. And I'm um, giving a tracker to Liz and to your um, infrastructure team and participating in those meetings. So I should have more to say on um, the next meeting when um, House and Senate finalized all their committee assignments and they can start doing hearings and working appropriations. Any questions? Um, yes, I just have a question, Lori. I wanted to see if there's something you can give me some information on. I know that Representative Cory Bush is doing a bus rapid transit. Um, or it may come into 2023. I kind of yes. want to keep track of that just because um, I think it's kind of important if, if that bill goes through, but I yeah. know that it's, she may be trying to initiate it this year. So she worked on it last year too. It is a very popular program. Okay. Um, yes, so can we keep track, track that of that too. please? Mm -hmm. Um, that's all the questions. That's all I had as, a, as far as for my, for the federal update. Does any of the members of the committee have any questions for Lori or anything that you want her to look into? Not Council member Zabonik, Council member Jarinski. Not at this time. No. Okay. And Angela, I was just going to say too, I know you uh, work closely with um, Dr. Cog and the transit agency. Today, um, the state and the transit agencies got their funding level announcement for FY 2023. Um, the state should be getting around 177 million dollars, and I'll send that table on to Liz right now, so she can share with you all the programs the state should be receiving this year, and then they'll allocate it out to the transit agencies. Okay, that would be great. And I'm still, um, I just got reappointed to the National C uh, National League of Cities Transportation Infrastructure oh, Committee, good. so I'll be on that committee again. <laughs> so okay, great. Okay, okay. Thank you, Lori. I appreciate it. Thank you. Goodbye. Have a good weekend. You too.
Okay, we've already talked to uh, Judge Day. Um, Council Member Zavonic, it looks like you have two resolutions that you would like to present. So do you want to go ahead and present those? Yep. And then we'll yep. get into the legislative update. Yep. Okay, thank you. So I'll start with the um, the motor vehicle theft resolution. And I see Pete on here too, so he might be able to answer any questions or fill in blanks that I that I uh, permit. But um, the idea behind this is that, and I know that there's legislation that's been introduced. In fact, Judge Day talked about it a little bit at the tail end of his update um, that uh, expands the classification of all vehicle thefts, regardless of, of the value um, to become a felony. Um, and I believe is it, it's going to increase the penalty. And what this resolution does is encourage the state to in fact move forward and, and to increase penalties on motor vehicle theft. Um, as, as you all know, we last year passed an ordinance at the municipal level to uh, create stiffer penalties for motor vehicle theft. It's a challenge that is um, we hear a lot from our, our community and our constituents, um, and we've, we've said at the time when we voted for it and passed it in Aurora that we needed a statewide solution, that the laws had become more permissive at the state level as it relates to motor vehicle theft. And it sounds like that this is an issue where both Democrats and Republicans uh, in the legislature are working toward a solution to kind of unwind some of the, um, the slack that they gave to, to uh, motor vehicle thieves. And so I hope that the city of Aurora will take a, a position, an affirmative position, encouraging our um, state lawmakers to make penalties for motor vehicle theft um, harsher because we need a statewide solution. And this is a, clearly an issue that is impacting uh, not just our community, but communities across the state. Pete, anything I missed? Uh, no, sir. I mean, basically, it's just to, to, to make it a little bit easier to prosecute. And, and kind of what will happen is we'll kind of take what we do already in Aurora and uh, make it statewide. So it'll be interesting to, to see if our ordinance becomes um, non-existent, if that bill passes. So hopefully so, it'll make it statewide. So um, I'm glad that uh, there's some traction on that too, so. Okay, um, before, I just have a question to our lobbyist. Um, you know, I've been on this committee for many, 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 many years and chaired it. So, you know, we, we brought very few resolutions through this committee. Um, because usually, you know, our positions taken are actually told to the sponsors and to the legislature. So with this, which I support council members of ONIC, this one, um, is this going to be, how do we, how are we going to relay this message? Do you, do you give this resolution to the legislature or to the sponsor and say, this is the position of the city of Aurora? I just want to know how this works because we rarely have done this. I would Anyone defer. I'm Does sorry. Go ahead. Does anyone want to respond to that? I would defer to Roberto, um, and I'm certainly happy to take it back to Peggy and Tatsi as well. Councilmember Lawson, in the past, as you know, we've done a sheet with the positions that we have taken all throughout the council, all throughout the session, and so we've generally the lobbyists have taken that sheet put it on the desk of our delegation and communicated that, I could see uh, an easy process in which we simply attach uh, this position, a summary of this position, and maybe even if they wanted it, I'm sure the resolution is not very long. Obviously, we could literally attach it to that uh, sheet that we've sent out to, to the delegation if, um, if that's what the committee wants to do. Okay, and I just bring that up because if we're doing the resolution and we're making a statement from the city, we already take a position. I just don't want this. I mean, th they need to see this. So, um, yeah. so I just wanted to make sure we I understood the process of how this would be done. Council members of Anik, I, I, did you want to comment? Yeah, I would just and I, I assume we've done uh, um, resolutions like this in the past. It's some of and oftentimes it'll be, you know, maybe CML wants all the cities to take an affirmative position. So they send us draft language um, on on a uh, uh, a resolution in support or in, in, in opposition to something. And, and I think you're right. I mean, we want legislators to see this. And I think the power of having a resolution specifically on these issues is it's a, it's a I believe and, and I hope the majority of, of our colleagues agree that these are issues that are um, above and beyond, you know, there's a lot of issues that we're going to talk about on this committee, but there are some that really impact our community right now. And I think that this one and the next resolution are two examples of those uh, types of issues that I hope we can bring to the attention of our of our uh, uh, state lawmakers. 
Yeah, and council member Zavonik, I know we've taken with we've done these type of things along with CML and other organizations. I'm just saying through this committee, this has it. This is I'm just trying to understand because again, we haven't had this many that have you know our colleagues doing resolutions. So I just want to make sure that if we're doing this, that we're just not doing it. You know, I know it's for a vote. Um, yeah. But, um, and I, cause I know the back end of it, but I just want to make sure if it's voted upon and it's supported that it is given to the state, to the legislature, so they can make sure that they know the position of the city of Aurora. So we will absolutely circulate that. Okay. Okay. So, um, for the committee council member, um, um, I support this 1 council member Jarinski, Do you support? I support it. Okay, and council members of we know you support as well. So we'll move this 1 forward either. I guess you're either going to move it to study session or to the floor. That'll be your decision. Yeah, yeah, and I think depending on the timing, because judge day did mention that this 1 in particular is it looks like there is a bill. And so maybe we could even uh, 1 amendment Pete that we might look at before we go is if there's a bill to reference that would be uh, good. I know on the next 1. Uh, it's more in the conceptual phase. There is conversations and there's likely to be a bill, but it's not quite there yet. So that one I might take some more time on this one. We'll move right. We will, we will certainly council member get you that bill number to reference in the document. Yeah, we get that to me as well. So I have it. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And by the way, this is I'm Pete Schulte that George sent me his link. So there's two George Kumatakis on today. So I'm Pete Schulte. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Pete, for that clarification. So, um, I guess we'll get the bill number and then um, council member Zavonik, it'll be your choice of you're going to move it to study session or you're going to move it to the floor. So yeah. I'll let you make that decision. Okay. Thank okay. You. Um, let's go to 1B. So th this 1 um, deals with the, the cap, the, the policy cap that is set by the state legislature on the number of beds that are available for juvenile detention. Um, as we know, youth violence uh, and violent, uh, incredibly violent youth violence has become a challenge in, in our city. Um, the, the state legislature has created an arbitrary cap on the number of beds that are available for juvenile detention. And one of the challenges that, that has resulted of this arbitrary cap is that we are now in a situation where the number of people who are, are youth who are committing um, very violent crimes are exceeding that number. And too often we're putting our judges in a position where they have to make a decision on either releasing somebody who's currently there or giving the person who just committed a crime an ankle bracelet and sending them back into the community. A couple of challenges I see with this for our city. One, um, unfortunately, and I would love to see there be no juveniles in juvenile detention, um, but the, we, I think we have to have a policy that's reflective of the reality that we face in our communities. And the reality is that we have um, too many kids committing very violent crimes. And when we have a policy that limits the number of people who can be in juvenile detention, we do two things. One, we further endanger our community because oftentimes these kids who are committing violent crimes uh, that qualify for juvenile detention are being sent back into the community where they're escalating the types of crimes they're committing. So it's endangering our community. And frankly, this is the other part that I think is important to make is that we're also jeopardizing these kids' futures because instead of being held in juvenile detention where they have an opportunity to kind of cool down and receive services, we're just putting an ankle bracelet on them and sending them back into the same environment they were in when they committed crimes. And then as they escalate the types of crimes that they commit, they're they're putting themselves in a position to be to have further uh, penalties and have uh, you know even longer term consequences um, from their actions. And so I think if we believe that any amount of beds, whether it's one or twenty or whatever the number is, if we believe that there are certain types of crimes that require juvenile detention beds be available, then we shouldn't have a cap, because the cap is at that point just completely arbitrary. And we talked about uh, last month in public safety, and I know that Councilmember Lawson is a big, uh, big supporter of this idea of focused deterrence and bringing that program to our uh, city. One of the, the reasons that that program is successful is that you have to have certainty of penalty. If you, if you cap the number of beds that are available for juveniles, you limit that ability to have certainty of penalty. So this arbitrary policy on the number of beds that we have available, I think is completely out of touch with the reality uh, that we face in our communities. And I know that there's conversations in the legislature about expanding it, but they're talking about increasing it by 10%. That means three more beds in Arapahoe County. Again, if we're going to accept there are certain types of crimes and we're not asking to expand the types of crimes that would qualify, 
We're just saying that if there are more kids who are committing these types of crimes, we have to have beds available for them. And it is a policy decision. It's not a physical uh, limitation uh, of bed space. It is a policy decision that I think is arbitrary and it's dangerous to our community. And so I hope that we will, as a city, advocate not just for the 10% increase, although I would, I would be happy with any increase, but I hope that our position is let's get rid of this arbitrary cap and allow judges to determine what, what kids need to stay in juvenile detention and which, which don't. Thank you, Councilmember Zavonik. So, um, Councilmember Zavonik, I think that you and maybe we need to kind of maybe inform Councilmember Jarinski. You received the email about the committee hearing, correct? Where they had the discussion on the delay of because they were trying to look into the beds. Uh, Cami, do you want to go into this or? or Absolutely. Roberto? Okay. Absolutely. I'm happy to go into it. Two years ago, Senator Buckner and Representative Doherty sponsored a bill which set the bed limit cap at 215. <laughs> the Department of Human Services has gone back to the Joint Budget Committee asking for that to be increased to 249. The Joint Budget Committee did meet this week and decided to go ahead and table the issue. Senator Zensinger, who's chair of the JVC, is in conversations with Representative Doherty, who is very hesitant to move the cap number. Uh, in the committee hearing, also Senator Kirkmeyer, who sits on the Joint Budget Committee, asked for more data to be provided, and so they decided to hold off on making a decision on the issue until figure setting. So that's where it rests right now. Um, I think there are politically there are challenges as we speak, trying to get that increase to the 249 level. Okay. Um, so I see that um, I just wanted to get the thoughts from, yes, Mr. Schulte. Uh, thank you, Councilman Lawson. I, I know Art's on or Chief Officer Blaine on all, uh, we've had conversations about this. One of the things that we're seeing on the police department side is that the the gang aspect of this is the older gang members are are putting or tasking the juveniles to commit the violent crimes, right? So they know, right? They know that if it's a juvenile, because of this limitation on bed space, most likely they're going to be out and about on a on an ankle monitor. So I think that's one thing the legislature can and may not be aware of. That guess what? You know, the criminal element is is smart enough uh, to know this. And I and I got to be honest, you know. I've, from Texas and I've been some other states. I'm licensed in Wyoming, Texas, and Colorado. Okay, another it's the only state that has a ban a cap, an arbitrary cap on the number of beds, because you just don't know, right, from year to year what kind of offenses the juveniles are going to uh to commit. And again, I think we're I think we're getting gained. And I know it's a money issue, Cam, as you stated, I know it's a political issue, um, but we're not gonna be able to combat the crime on the juvenile side unless we can keep some of these heinous offenders. And my DA, my DA friends, we actually have to deal with juvenile cases. They literally tell me, Pete, I got to go into a, a, you know, into the morning. Uh, somebody's in a juvenile that's in custody, and look, which one is worse, right? I have to take one alleged murderer versus another one because I can't put both of them uh, in detention, and and that's just not that's not good for our for our, our justice system. Yeah, and and I'll let Roberto just one second here. I, I mean, I support, I guess where I'm trying to figure out, because I understand where Councilmember Zavonik is coming from. But right now, we kind of have a maybe a possibility of getting some data. It's kind of been a whole pattern, but it's a possibility. And I'm just wondering if we do this resolution saying from the city of Aurora, we don't want any cap at this point with everything kind of just kind of unbalanced right now, are we putting ourselves in the position that maybe those legislators will say, well, the city of Aurora is like, we're going to try to go with no cap. Should we, I guess I'm just conflicted on, we have a potential depending on the data, the data setting or whatever information is required to maybe get some beds and then move towards this other issue that council member Zavonik is bringing forward. And that's where I'm conflicted not saying I don't support his resolution, but I'm just wondering if that's going to unbalance anything. If we have something coming from the city of Aurora saying no cap, you know, when we, we could have a potential of getting something. And to me, something is better than nothing and then moving towards a bigger goal. So that's kind of my, my position right now, Roberto. Um, Councilman Blossom, I was just going to indicate that, you know, I, 
setting aside how the politics will play out, I'll leave that to to you guys as policymakers how you want to how you want to uh, you know adjust for that. And obviously, our lobbyists letting us know how <clears throat> how that might be received from legislators. I will say that uh, we are trying to do, given the conversation and the questions that were asked during the committee meeting, we're trying to pull together uh, some data that that paints the picture of exactly what Councilmember Zavonik is describing and Pete's describing in terms of anecdotally what we're seeing. We need to get with human services, we need to get with the DAs to really see caseloads month by month, how many of these folks and what kinds of offenders when they were, you know, I think the JBC, obviously given their role, are gonna need some uh, compelling data to be able to make that uh, argument. I think they left the door open um, I think it's still a big lift given some of the resistance from the majority on both sides, but I think they left the door open enough for us to be able to get some data to provide to them to be able to make a more compelling case beyond the anecdotes, which we know are true, but some more kind of case loads, who are the violent offenders, who's getting put back on the street, who's not, and at what level uh, over time, over the last, you know, six, 12 months, whatever the time period we figure uh, we're doing. So Liz and I are working to try to get that data and uh, Jessica and other folks who worked with the team that went to Tulsa and the DAs and try to get that information. So aside from the resolution, I think we can do the work of trying to ask, answer the questions that the JBC was looking for. I think it's really more of a policy decision from you if you'd, if, if the resolution uh, puts us in a better place to, to make that case, um, I, I'm, I'm agnostic on that. I really just think we have a door that's open. And the more that we can get da uh, data there, the, the better. So I'll defer to the committee on how they want to proceed. And can I just let, before we get to Cami and then council member Zavonik, um, can I get chief um, Acevedo, um, you wanted to speak on this? He, Chair, he's been commenting. He can't, he wasn't able to get on, but he has, he put his full comments in the chat. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Jarinski. Um, I'll, I'll look at those comments. Okay, um, Councilmember uh, Cami. Well, and then we'll go to you, Councilmember Zavonik. Sorry. Okay. No problem. I was, I was just going to say, Councilmember Lawson. I think you're exactly right. I think getting some um, additional beds is obviously better than remaining where we are. Having said that, Roberto, I think d supplying or providing us with that data that we can take back will be super helpful. Tati, Peggy, and I all have been lobbying the JBC members on this particular issue. Um, so we're happy to continue that down that path and however you choose to proceed. Okay, Council Member Zavonik. Yeah, I would just say this. I, I I agree, and I understand there's the the politics of what the reality is, right? So getting 10 percent increase in, in bed would be better than than nothing. Um, but I believe that that it is still the wrong policy for our community, and I think that a 10 percent increase, while better than our current position, is still not good enough for the city of Aurora, and we should fight for. The, the the policy that's going to protect our citizens and that's going to do better by these juveniles who are committing these crimes and escalating when they're released back into the same environment with an ankle monitor and are, are further hurting their future. I believe that the best policy for uh, is a no arbitrary cap um, and that we should uh, we should advocate for the best policy, recognizing that we might fall short of that because of there's not the political will in the legislature, which I think is wrong, but we should show that we have the political will to stand up and fight for what's right. Okay, Cami, did you have something that you wanted to address? Okay, and then Chief says, Chief was, I'm just reading some of his comments just for the public record. Chief, uh, uh, Chief Acevedo, he says, we are placing youthful offenders at risk, our greater community officers. These youth need to be in a safe environment instead of being used by older folks exploiting them. Colorado Chief supports as well. Do, I, um, APD has multiple examples of youth being released on a monitor only to reoffend by committing violent crimes. And APD strongly urges we create more bed space. So that's what the Chief has in his comments. So um, we have one B. Uh, I, um, I guess we'll go with the, the votes. Um, Council member Jarinski, do you support moving this forward? And I adding agree. it to the, um, the legislative document or legislative position of the committee. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I will be a no at this time because I'm trying to, I think that it's going to be some confliction. So I will be no. It doesn't mean I don't support it. Council member Zavonik, but I think that it does to me. It will add some a different messaging and I'm just trying to think something is better than nothing. At least we can move to that 
and then kind of move forward on the other part. So I won't be supporting this, but it will move forward as you will support as well. So yes, no problem. Thank okay. you. And then um, Council Member Zavonik, you can move it to the study session and to um, however you want to present that to the full council for further support. Okay, thank you. Okay. You all have a good weekend. You too. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, Appreciate Pete. it. Okay, um, let's go to our state legislative update. And we have Peggy or we have Totsi and Cami. And did you want to start on that? Liz, why don't you go in on your on the positions? What we can start there if you'd like. Unless I, I don't see Peggy on the call. Okay, so there's no. Oh, so we're just going to go with the positions then. There's no general update. Unless Cami. Yes. The... <clears throat> there is the general update. I apologize, my computer froze. Um, I wanted to update the group on Senate Bill One, which was heard this week by Senators Roberts and Zenzinger, which would transfer five million from the general fund and eight million from the housing development grant fund to unused state-owned real real property fund. And that money would then go to public and private partnerships that would build affordable housing on state owned land. The committee heard testimony from several business groups to express support for the public private partnership opportunities. It did pass out of state local affairs on a vote of 6 to 1. The no was Senator. Rod Pelton, a Republican, and that will move to appropriations. I also want to thank council member Lawson for testifying this week on Senate bill 3, which was the Colorado adult high school program bill. She did a fantastic job. The bill did pass unanimously out of Senate education and will go to appropriations. Um, I will provide a brief update on House Bill 23-1118, which is the Fair Work Week Employment Standards Bill. This bill imposes requirements for certain types of employers. This would have an impact on thousands of public and private employers while placing new restrictions on scheduling practices, and it really will hurt those that it intends to help. The business community has serious concerns with this piece of legislation right now. It's been assigned to house business affairs and labor. Uh, I will also update the group on house bill 23 1115, which repeals the prohibition on local resident rent control. The governor, we understand his office may have some concerns with this bill. It's been assigned to transportation, housing and local government. And then the equal pay bill CML is still trying to work with the bill sponsor on changes and they will continue to do so. We understand that that bill may be dropping on Monday. And then lastly, Senator Fields bill on juvenile personal information should be introduced any day now. So that is kind of my legislative overview update. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, before I go to um, the committee, Totsi, do you have any updates that you want to give from your, your side? Of things? Yes, please. Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry again that I was late. I just wanted to let you know that the, there's an update on the Cora bill. Colorado Press Association met with CML and CCI Wednesday, and that bill now is a um, complete exemption for the press to pay any fees. CCI and CML are both still opposed to it. We haven't seen the next, the latest draft CPA uh, Press Association hasn't shared that, but I'm hoping to have that this weekend or they, I mean, they're under some deadline scrutiny, so that may be introduced next week. And thank you again, Council Member Lawson, for testifying this week. Okay. Is there any questions from the committee on the legislative update that was provided by Cami and Totsi? Um, I have a question. Council Member Jarinski. Yeah, so the ones that Cami presented to us, um, there's a couple of those I'm pretty passionate about. Um, are we taking positions on those, or is this just like an update? We're monitoring everything and we're not taking positions on those. It's my understanding that we were just providing an update and a brief overview on those bills. 
And Council Member Jurinsky, some of those we probably will be taking positions because they impact the city. You know, when you're talking about the business ones. So, um, Liz, do you want to give an update of when those bills will we be having those probably come up at the next meeting? Yes, they will likely be coming up at the next meeting. Um, we currently have them and are circulating them internally for some internal feedback before we present them. So, Council Member Jurinsky, uh -huh. thank you. Um, I. Uh, um, the Tavern League, I'm just letting you know, the Tavern League is asking me to go down and um, speak about the work, uh, the work week and predictability pay bill. So I just want to give you that heads up. Do you know when we're taking a, I mean, it would be strong. I mean, I know you want to go down there for, you know, because you're a business owner, except, et cetera, and supporting that or however, not supporting or whatever your position well, is, it's, but I guess. It's the lobbyists from the Tavern League. That okay. Is to. there any way that we know? Um, I don't know when that comes up, but will that be coming up before before the city before we could take a position on it? I think it just adds more value to the testimony when Councilmember Jarinski yes. goes down there. I know that uh, Representative Sorota is having a test for is having a stakeholder meeting. On that bill next week, and okay. I, so it's not going to hearing before that stakeholder meeting will be held. Okay, so if you could keep us posted on that, that would be Absolutely. great. Absolutely, um, and then we can when that when that's coming up. So, and Councilmember Jurinsky, I'm not. You can go down there. I'm just saying, yeah. whatever the city position is, it would add more. You know what our position is on that bill. Or yeah, it's a great control one um, too. If the governor's office decides that he doesn't end up having issues with that, and that one goes forward, I hope to see that come through committee to take a position as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Jurinsky. Councilmember Zavonic, do you have any questions or anything that you wanted to add? No. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, my apologies. I didn't hear you. No, so. I was on mute. That was my fault. Okay. Okay. okay thank you, Totsi and Cami, for those updates. And then um, we'll be, I guess, expecting when those hearings are when those committee hearings are coming up. So thank you so much for those updates. Okay, Liz. Uh, we it looks like we have some things, some um, legislative items that we need to take positions on. Yes, we have two ask and then a couple of informational items for everyone. Um, the first one is a support if asked position for Senate Bill 23-052, Municipal Priority Lien Surviving Treasures Deed. Um, so under the current law, a municipality can levy a lien against a property, and this would be for removing weeds, bush, or other kind of debris around the property. Um, however, if a property is foreclosed upon, the municipality's lien can be removed. So what this bill would do would exempt the municipality's lien from being removed from foreclosure homes. Um, the position is recommended as support if asked, as it is favorable to the city um, to be able to recoup for services that have been rendered. Okay, um, first, the first thing I want to ask, is there anyone on here that would like to speak to this? Add any additional information from the city? Okay. Seeing none, um, I am in support of the city's recommendation. Council members of do you have any questions and what's your position? I have no questions and I support. Okay, council member Jurinsky. I also support it. Okay, we'll move to the next one. Okay, the next bill is a oppose if asked. It's for House Bill 23-1061, alcohol beverage retail establishment permit. So this bill would um, broaden the retail permit uh, so that all Retail establishments can attain a permit um, to serve complimentary alcohol beverages 24 times a year for four hours and serving up to 250 people. The city can so reject an application for the permit, but only if the city believes that the applicant cannot comply with the requirements of the liquor code and the event will not create a public safety risk to the neighborhood. So um, staff has noted that while it would have a limited impact over our authority, there are several concerns. Um, first about capping local fees for the permit. Um, additional staff may be needed by the city if we get a lot more permits than we are expecting for this. Um, and then there also could be some public safety impacts. And we do have Trevor Vaughn, the manager of licensing, to help assist with any questions from council members. 
Hey, Trevor, do you want to go ahead and add to this or have any other additional information? Uh, maybe just a little bit. When I first saw this, I had kind of a, a strong and initial reaction and the negative to it, but kind of thought about it a little bit. There are some ways to mitigate uh, the risks on the city side. There's obviously obviously some benefits uh, to businesses, um, you know, that, that would want to do this. I think in most cases it would be uh, probably without issue. Um, some of the public safety concerns that I just, you know, th worry about and think about, um, you know, we've had some examples where we've had some some kind of pop up parties uh, that have resulted in in violence and issues at, you know, for example, at a beauty salon on Colfax had an open invite birthday party that resulted in a shooting uh, five uh, juveniles outside of that. We've had a number of issues with hookah lounges with alcohol in there illegally. Um, and now I could just kind of see situations where they would have, you know, they'll they'll start pulling these permits, you know, and, and they'll sell the hookah. They won't charge an entrance fee, uh, but we'll start serving alcohol in there and we'll look very much like a bar. And we've had some neighborhood impacts from that. And we also know that then they'll have, um, you know, we've been pretty strict on them as far as alcohol possession on those premises and not allowing that. And now they'll have the alcohol there probably even when they don't have a permit. And then when nobody's looking, the, the, there could be issues with them serving it. So it kind of makes it a, more of a challenge with addressing some of those issues. And unlike a, um, a liquor licensee currently, you know, uh, they, there's a lot of risk if they don't uh, operate lawfully if you're a liquor licensee um, and you have a lot of over service and you have uh, DUIs in the neighborhood, you have noise, you have fights, uh, shootings in the area. Um, you know, a liquor licensee has a lot to risk with that. And, and uh, there's consequences, you know, when you have those neighborhood impacts and usually there's there's more experience and training with somebody who has a liquor license. And and so there's just not the same level, uh, I think, of investment and risk uh, with somebody who doesn't hold a liquor license, um, you know, as far as that that goes. Granted, this is supposed to be complimentary beverages. The time frame is limited, but, you know, I could see areas where somebody without experience might get a little bit out of control there and um, just just not the same way to 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 address it. So just some some uh, public safety concerns um, that I have uh, with it. There may be some again, some ways to address that. The other thing is uh, mentioning that there is a fee cap in here and there's a fee cap of twenty five dollars on the state liquor or the state review of the permit and one hundred dollars on the city review of the permit. And I know my audience here is not uh, keen on on big fees, and I'm not saying that that $100 isn't enough, you know, to cover our costs at this point. The problem is when you put it in statute, um, you know, if the way and in inflation's going, we may not be able to cover our costs, you know, 20 years down the road when this hasn't been updated. Um, and particularly with the state cap of $25, I have concerns uh, because state liquor, uh, they have to cover their costs with fees. And so if the costs to review and process these at the state, exceeds $25, it may actually be uh, subsidized by people who hold liquor licenses by higher fees in those areas. Uh, so that's just kind of my concern. And then I just kind of think, you know, they're going from just art galleries, which I can't find a record of us issuing an art gallery permit, um, just the, 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 the very rapid, broad expansion of this program and, and would just think that, that they might want to uh, selectively uh, uh, start uh, expanding it first rather than, than going so broad so we can kind of see the impact and the amount of the workload. Um, I do foresee this bringing in a lot of uh, permit apps potentially um, and substantial workload for us to to kind of uh, chase that and make sure everything's uh, okay and, and getting those processed. So that's just what I wanted to add to that. Thank you, Trevor. Um, to the committee, Councilmember Zavonik or Councilmember Jarinski, do you have any questions for Trevor on this? Councilmember Jarinski. Um, so I have a few, can, can, I'm sorry, can you just read again what this is complimentary liquor license for how many times a year and how many days, can you, can you say that part again? It's a uh, 24, it's uh 24 times a year that a business could do this. Um, and the, uh, the requirements that they have in the bill that, that it has to be complimentary up to four hours. Um, and then they can't charge a, a cover charge. Um, though, as I mentioned, there may be other ways to kind of indirectly recoup the costs. I mean, ideally, that's what they're doing anyway, is trying to bring people into the business to, you know, perhaps sell them whatever products they have. Well, I first find it interesting that for liquor liability insurance, um, I know people that have been turned down 
um, for liquor uh, liability insurance coverage because they were offering a different time periods or as part of their happy hour or whatever, they were offering complimentary drinks, essentially free drinks, you know, whether it's like ladies night free drinks or whatever it is. Um, so, I mean, I think that that speaks to your point that it is a huge liability um, for a lot of reasons. And also too, Trevor, um, for special permits, um, like when I've had the parking lot parties, stuff like that, which are one day events, what are the fees that I'm currently paying? I believe the uh, modif that's a modification of premises for an existing liquor establishment, and that would be um, $150 to modify, and then it's $150 to modify out. So if you have two, you know, if you do it temporarily, it's $300. Mm -hmm. I think is what those fees have changed. I could be could be wrong on that. That's just my most recent memory of that. Do you only um, do that twice a year, Trevor? Um, you can do it as um, I think you can do that as often as you want, uh, as far as the modification of premise. Okay. I think it's twice a year. I just want to double check. I applied for that permit a lot. I've applied for it a lot. It, <laughs> I well, I I think it's because of um, it's it, you can do it twice on one one permit, so it's like three hundred dollars, and then you have to file another form to do it again. Is what I think it is. And, and so yeah. these other businesses for just a hundred dollars, twenty four times a year, are would get a complimentary liquor license. Is essentially what this is saying. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'm prepared to take my position. Jarinski, do you um, want to take your position on this bill? Yeah, I strongly oppose this bill. Okay. Councilmember Zavonic, do you have any questions for Trevor? Um, and then what's your position on the bill? I oppose. I guess one question I do have for you, Trevor, is if it were to pass, is there anything in the language that allows cities to promulgate rules? You'd mentioned some ways that we could potentially, you know, tighten up some of the, um, you know, areas or, or businesses in different uh, parts of the city. Are there ways for the city to add additional regulations if it were to pass to, to protect our community, I guess? Yeah, and that's kind of where I was thinking through that. I think there is some ways to do that. Part of the issue is that bill does say, uh, tells us basically we have to issue the permits. Um, and that's oftentimes the issue with the liquor code is, you know, a full out prohibition may not be permissible it'd be something i have to talk with legal about but right. there are ways that we could set up criteria in regards to what we think is needed in order to ensure public safety um, and so we could could certainly outline some areas along that along those lines okay yeah so to answer your question i'm fine with being opposed to it but just had that question on if it does pass i have one more question Councilmember yeah, um Trevor, you just said, you know, that the language in the bill states that we have to issue these. Is there anything set up that if in one of these complimentary licenses that there's some sort of liquor violation um, that that same person can't reapply? Yeah, it does say that okay. we can we could yank the permit. We could also deny them in the future for for violations. So I think that in and of itself, if this passes, that's also, I mean, that will also be helpful, but I still stand strongly opposed to this. And I um, support the city's position of oppose as well. Thank you, Trevor. I appreciate it. Great. Okay, so the next three items I have for you all are informational items. Um, these are, we're not asking for a position, but we think it's important to bring these items up to this committee um, just so they are aware. So the first one is the um, bill from uh, Senator Fields, removing children's identifying information, just keeping this on our radar. Um, so when the bill does come out, we're able to um, make a motion and note that the city has been supportive of it as per the study session, the 23rd. Um, the next one, if there are any questions on that, we can move forward. Is there any questions from the committee? No. Okay, no. Move okay. forward. <laughs> the next informational item is just regarding affordable housing. Uh, there is no written language right now or draft on affordable housing, but we have noted that the governor's office has been working on affordable housing legislation for the last couple of weeks. We expect to see something by March, but there has been rumors circulating about the removal of local control of building designations, altering water tap fees, and making changes to zoning requirements. Um, so this is just an informational item, but we want to make the committee aware that 
that this may be coming out um, and is something we expect to bring. Any questions from the committee? Okay, move forward. The last one is a draft concerning the use of micro trenching to install fiber for broadband service development. Um, essentially, this bill would, uh, it's a draft right now, but it would require local government to approve an excavation application for the use of micro trenching to install underground fiber for broadband service. Local governments would have limited exemptions to halt the process. Um, so after reviewing some of the drafts of this bill, internal staff are concerned as it may create traffic closures, geographical fairness concerns, interference with existing utility lines and will infringe on local control. A second draft is expected. So once we have seen the final draft um, and staff has been able to review it, we do expect to bring a position recommendation to the committee. So um, we do have a couple of staff members from Public Works on here to answer questions about that draft, but we are not recommending a position at this time. Okay. Um, any questions from the committee on the micro trenching broadband? The broadband, Council Member Lawson, the broadband? Yes. The broadband and Councilor Jurinsky, do you have a comment on the broadband? You know, I was giving the microphone to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if there's no comments on that, um, Council Member Zavonic, do you have any questions or um, that you would like to ask about the micro trenching broadband? No, not at this time. Okay, thank you, Liz, for those updates. Um, everyone. Okay, so we're going to move on. If there's nothing else, we're going to move on to the water update, Kathy. Kind of um, happy to read. Oh, I, I apologize. I am at the Hyatt Regency and the Colorado Water Congress conference just wrapped up. Are you hearing me okay? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, first, I wanted to say that we are still getting accolades and positive. Statewide. I apologize. We continue to get positive statewide. Uh, and um, we are currently tracking 15 um, bills that have been introduced, but all of them are monitor or support of uh, Nothing to bring to the committee at this time. Um, since I'm breaking up, I will leave it there unless there are any questions. Okay, is there any questions from the committee from what we kind of heard from Kathy? So. <laughs> <laughs> so. I don't think so, Kathy. So have fun at the conference and uh, we'll look forward to your report next um, in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Um, is there any miscellaneous or items for consideration from the committee members? Okay, I want to give one little shout out to the city of Aurora. I was sitting on the, I was just before this meeting on the um, executive board for the Colorado Municipal League. And we asked for a civic kind of engagement of the members and of in the municipalities. That's what the board asked for. And we got the results and Aurora came in um, number one on the, one of the most engaged cities with CML. Um, and that was based on attendance at events participation in committees and multi in the muni university recognition. So uh, we were number one, we came, our score was 519. Um, Fort Collins came below a 518, but out of the 10, Aurora was number one. So for 2022, for participation with our league. So um, I was happy to hear that and see that result and I hope we can do that again in 2023. So. Good job team. Just wanted to mention that. Um, so for our colleagues, um, our next meeting is February 10th. It's going to be in person. Do you still, are we still okay with in-person meeting for February 10th? Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anything else that the committee members want to bring up for miscellaneous or anything you want to talk about before we adjourn? Nope. I'll set on my end. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend and we'll see you soon. Thanks, you too. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.